the lake created at Grahamstown covers more than 2,500 hectares. Earlier this year, amendments to legislation introduced by the Minister for Water Resources, Janice Crozio, paved the way for more public access to land owned by water supply authorities. Port Stephenshire Council has accepted responsibility for the development and management of recreational activities at Grahamstown. These would include sailing, rowing and fishing, but motorboats would be banned. Certain other steps would also have to be taken before the lake would be open to the public. We have to assess, once we know the final proposal that the council has, we'll have to assess the environmental impact of the proposal on the wildlife on the lake in, uh, in essence. On the uh, engineering works here, it will have some impact on those. For example, we'll have to uh, uh, bar activities in certain areas of the lake. And there's some legal ramifications as to just how we would uh, arrange a management agreement with the council. Who's going to bear the cost of any proposed development? Well, in, in the uh, recreational uses, that would be borne by the users. Uh, there are aspects of the management of the recreational facility which there, where there will be costs borne by the board, but those costs would largely be uh, ranger activity, uh, care of the foreshores, which we do now anyway. But the new facilities, uh, the new use, would be at the cost of the users. contest in uh, Zurich is a very big contest. There are seven days of contesting there, both in music and marching. So when that's all over, we're giving them two days in London on the way home, just for a little fun time and to see some of the sights that they would never see otherwise. How do you think they'll fare against international competition? Well, very well. They've got a, a good sound, they're playing very well and being full of enthusiasm, I think they should do very well. billowing in the gentle breeze was a great crowd pleaser. Kookaburra sailed up the harbour to an enthusiastic and warm welcome, her crew particularly earning the envy of all present. At only 27 years of age, her young skipper and co-designer Ian Murray is enjoying his role as a key figure in Task Force 87 and believes that Australia will retain the prize trophy in the America's Cup Challenge. The trip was... Uh... For this time of the year it was exceptionally pleasant, it uh, was quite a mild night with uh, very little seaway out there and, and very little wind to add any chill factor to it, so it's uh, very pleasant. Although Kookaburra is favoured as a strong contender for the race in 87, this particular vessel may not be the one that actually races. Yeah, that's right. We, this syndicate is building three boats and uh, we certainly hope that this is not the one that uh, uh, we'll be using because it means we'll, we will have gone backwards, our development won't have worked. The, uh, this is very much a, the prototype boat, shall we say, or the development boat. It has uh, been built very strongly and um, has the ability to be changed around and consequently is a little heavy and uh, we can make big improvements on this boat. When the improvements are made, how do you rate our chances? This uh, syndicate, the Kookaburra Task Force Syndicate, is uh, is very very strong. We have a uh, tremendous depth in uh, the people in terms of experience and uh, and the uh, direction in which they know in which we have to go to uh, do what we want. Oliver 
would seem to be the ideal play for a company like the Young People's Theatre. The cast for this production is 80 people, 50 of whom are youngsters, who remain the biggest adult performers. This gives the youngsters an opportunity to not only perform in a large-scale production, but also to work with more experienced and mature performers. The theatre company chose Oliver with international youth work in mind. According to director Don McCure, the play has many things going for it. Well, the music for one, the music is is very popular. Most people know the music for Oliver, like Where Is Love As Long As He Needs Me, Reviewing the Situation, Consider Yourself. They're all very popular and standard numbers. Uh, the show's been very popular since it was first performed back in the 60s. Uh, we are trying to do it a little differently. Um, it's always been done in a lighter vein, like 10 years ago when it, that was the last time it was done. Attitudes in theatre have changed since then. Theatre has become, musical theatre has become more realistic with like Jesus Christ Superstar and things like that. Where Authors have tried to bring out the, the darker side of life, if you like. Um, this had the elements in it to begin with. Well, we've tried to bring out that darker side of life as, and you know, to form a balance with the, with the good and the bad, the happy and the sad, etc. Today, Telecom paid a surprise visit on a young nurse living in Shedden Street, Islington. The purpose of the visit was not to disconnect the service, but rather hand over a free phone. You see, today Telecom celebrates its 10th birthday as a commission. The lucky person was Eileen Hicks, whose name was drawn out of a hat. After the official handover by Telecom District Manager, Mr Headley Ingham, Eileen was all smiles. A Telecom technician checked the line and gave it the all clear. But let's hope we don't have to wait another 10 years before Telecom opens its purse strings again. No, um... The Raring Power Station is Australia's largest generating complex, a project which cost $1.65 billion. Officially opened just over a year ago, the power station was constructed within the original time estimate. The station's coal-fired boilers power four 660 megawatt generators, and it's a tribute to the station's design that these powerful units can be run at full load for prolonged periods with little or no visible chimney emissions, low noise levels, and a minimum heating effect on the waters of Lake Macquarie. The feature of the Araring complex is a cooling water canal which crosses Dora Creek by a unique viaduct. The station's control room is a good example of modern computerised systems control and is backed by a $6 million control room simulator used for training purposes. The Clary Hall Dam at the foot of Mount Warning near Kyogle is named after a former mayor of the area. The purpose of the dam is for drought relief. Water released from the dam flowing naturally by riverbed down to the existing weir and water treatment plant west of the Willembar. The dam has been constructed mainly of rock quarried from a point about 150 metres upstream of the main dam wall. Pleasant picnic areas have been arranged around the wall. There are also fully sealed access roads to vantage points above the dam in the catchment area and playing fields have been constructed. As well as adequately serving its water control requirements, the dam has become a significant tourist attraction. Newcastle's third coal loader, the Kurugan coal loader, is a good example of effective planning. The complex meets all its design criteria now, with a loading capacity of 15 million tonnes per annum, but it's been constructed in such a way that a further two-stage expansion, lifting loading capacity to 50 million tonnes per annum, could be carried out at minimum cost. Built on reclaimed swamp land and consolidated by moving a super layer of sand around the site, the loader's conveyor belt system has been designed to allow for future subsidence. Considerable attention has been paid to dust control and protection of the surrounding sensitive environment. The $300 million project was completed ahead of schedule and well under budget.
one of the reasons the Lingard IVF program at Lingard is unique in a number of ways. Then, it was the first program to be established outside a public hospital. As, as well, man. the entire to procedure to is carried out under the, the one roof. So far, the program the has 20 confirmed Here pregnancies. The first two births from eggs fertilized at Lingard are expected any day now. Last week brought good news for this couple, Chris and Sue Gould of Thornton. Sue is pregnant after a long and emotional wait. Despite the lengthy preparation, Chris says he was still surprised. Oh yes, it's a bit of a shock. Um, it was a third attempt and it was a bit of a shock, uh, but yes, it's had one. And the announcement Sue that you are spoke pregnant, frankly today how was that about the test tube option. She says there are a lot of things she At didn't home know, too? and she wants oh. the public to become more aware. It's a lot more to it than the general public think. There was a lot more to it than what I knew when I first became involved. It's not till you've been through a treatment that you really know all what is involved. You're better prepared for your second treatment and even your third treatment because you know exactly what's involved. Is there a lot of surgery involved? There's one operation involved to collect the eggs. There's a lot of blood tests, monitoring, injections, ultrasound x-rays leading up to it. And then you have your, your surgery to collect the eggs and then a two-day wait. And then the, the embryo transfer. Now the first implant is not always successful, is it? No. What's the feeling when it's not successful? It's a deep sense of loss. I had two attempts where I had four embryos implanted each time and you feel a loss of, of those four potential children each time. Is there any fear that there, something might go wrong this time or is there a sense of hope or what? There's a sense of hope but there's always that in the back of your mind. I, the reason I was sterilised was through numerous miscarriages. So there's always that in the back of my mind that it could happen again but I'm optimistic. I wouldn't have gone on the program if I wasn't. I knew it would happen eventually. So it's just a matter of waiting now. Sue, what's the reaction been at home? How have the children reacted to the news? My 11-year-old son, all he's interested in is he wants to deliver the baby himself. <laughs> no, they're really thrilled. is being trialled all over the world. The research in Newcastle is being made possible by a quarter of a million dollar grant from a Swiss pharmaceutical company and is being conducted by a team of scientists from Newcastle University. The trial includes 400 paid volunteers, as team leader Dr Greg Tannock explains. We've had remarkable cooperation with the community. Uh, we started off with a, a number of close to 600 who indicated they're willing to participate, but for one reason or another weren't eligible. But uh, yes, I think it speaks very well of the Newcastle community and the faculty's uh, relations with the community. Each of the volunteers is using the interferon nasal spray twice a day and is recording each sniffle and cough. It isn't available to the public yet, but initial results are encouraging. Dr Tannock says the conclusions of the research won't be finalised for about three months. The research also involves identifying different types of viruses and where they originate, and considering respiratory infections are the largest cause of absenteeism, that will be valuable knowledge indeed. workshop was well attended by a cross-section of the business community. Representatives from various industries, the public service, consultants and manufacturers listened intently to advice on using videos for business communication, training and the selling of products. Senior lecturer for the Department of Commerce at Newcastle University, Russell Craig, believes that videos will play an important role in the business sector. He says that they provide an interesting alternative to other methods of selling. A lot of people would seem to think that it's a far more effective medium for getting the message across. 
uh, certainly a, a lot of companies are finding this and uh, are using it for training purposes, for selling purposes and uh, for purposes of corporate relations. Is video just used in business as a hard selling instrument? No, no, certainly not. Uh, it's, uh, there's a tremendous range of applications in business um, from um, the use in uh, presenting annual reports to shareholders, um, uh, news magazine style programs to employees, even uh, lobbying programs uh, prepared by companies lobbying governments. What's the future of for video in the business industry? Well the future is very very bright indeed and uh, there's certainly been a lot of interest here today um, from people in the Hunter Valley. Uh, I think in the future we're likely to see a, a tremendous growth in the use of uh, video conferencing, the video conferencing of business meetings for example. It would be uh, quite feasible for example to uh, link up Sydney and Newcastle for business meetings by means of video. Explained. The first church was built on the corner of Lindsay and Lawson Streets in 1899. It was built for £300, I think the price was. And the church group started in a tent mission? They had a tent mission on the present side of Gregson Park. That's where the first tent mission started, um, possibly 12 months before the church, the first church was built. Since the early hours of this morning, about 2,000 volunteers, including Salvation Army workers and service club members, have knocked on doors throughout Newcastle, asking people to give generously. By midday, in many suburbs, most of the door knocking was done, and then the task of counting the money began. Once again, volunteers, including bank workers and accountants, provided the necessary expertise. Spokesman for the Salvation Army Central New South Wales Division, Alan Peterson. How much money are you hoping to raise? For the Hunter, it's 465000 For Newcastle, it's 225000 Does it look like you'll come close to those amounts? Well, at the current, uh, the way it's coming in, we're 14% up uh, uh, as at the same time last year, and we're asking for 10% up, so it looks like we should. Do you expect money to keep on coming in over the next few weeks? Yes. Folk who haven't uh, given today will have an envelope in their letterbox and uh, they could just put their money or check in that and return it through the post to us. The, the appeal officially closes on the 15th of August because we know from experience that money still trickles in afterwards and that we do depend on that to reach the final figure. You know. Thirteen percent of Australian babies are born with some form of serious physical disability and when you add that to people who are disabled as a result of an accident, you're faced with a significant proportion of our population. According to the organisers at Camp Breakaway, these are the forgotten people. Most of this year's campers are only physically handicapped. Their minds are active and are trapped in a body that can't do what they want it to. Everybody's great. I mean, everybody talks to each other. And everyone's having a great time. They forget about everything else. The program was started by Rotarians in 1982, so some of the helpers are from Rotary Clubs. But there are also volunteers from the community and unemployed people from the Budgie Boy SIS scheme. The aim of the camp is to give parents of the handicapped a break, as well as provide a holiday for their children. The 
a great need. There is no uh, facilities for holidays for handicapped people, particularly the physically handicapped within Australia. I was speaking to one fellow last night who is uh, 18 year old and has lived in an institution all his life and this is his first holiday. The helpers and campers at Camp Breakaway want a permanent home. The Electricity Commission has already given them land at a low rent near San Remo on the Central Coast. They've raised $65,000, but they need at least $400,000 more.